When I was young, I thought about growing up and getting married. When I was a child, I dreamed of falling in love and getting married. Today, I'm happily married. I have a beautiful wife and a terrific son. Fortunately, I did fall in love. Unfortunately, I can't get married because I'm gay. But my partner Casey and I have been blessed with an amazing family, which includes our son Ryan. I don't think it's fair that I can marry the woman that I love and my sister cannot. I love my children equally. And I believe that both my son Robert and my daughter Stacy, as well as my other children, are entitled to marry the person they love, whoever that may be. Hi, I'm Betty DeGeneres. You probably know my daughter Ellen, the actress and comedian. She also happens to be gay and she's one of the most loving people I've ever met, even if I am a bit biased. That's why I want to talk about a topic that's been in the news quite a bit lately. Why do gays and lesbians want to get married? And why can't they? I Can't Marry You is a documentary about same-sex couples wanting the freedom to marry. During this documentary, You'll get a glimpse at a variety of gay and lesbian couples and how they live their lives together. These people all have been in long-term, committed relationships for about 10 years or longer. In fact, one couple has been together for more than 55 years. Let's meet them now. We're Mark and Jim. We've been together for 55 years, and we live in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We're Kate and Lisa. We've been together for almost 10 years, and we just relocated to San Francisco from New York State. We're Tony and Gary. We've been together for 13 years, and we live in Greenwich Village in New York City. We're Cindy and Karen, and we're from Asheville, North Carolina, and we've been together for 18 years. We are John and Javier. We live in Miami, Florida, and we've been together 14 years. We're Kevin and Brian. We've been together almost 17 years, and we live in San Francisco. I'm Carl, this is Larry, and we've been together 34 years and we live in Saugatuck, Michigan. We're Joan and Shirley, we live in West Palm Beach, Florida, and we've been together for almost 30 years. My name is Larry Courtney, I live in Manhattan, New York. Uh, my lover was Eugene Clark, they called him Gene. We've been together for 14 years. Uh, he died at the World Trade Center on September 11th. I'm Maria. This is Robin. We've been together for 12 years, and we live in Berkeley. My name is Fernando Juanes, and uh, Eddie and I have been together for 13 years. And we live in Miami Shores. We're Joe and Doug. We've been together almost 10 years, and we live in New York City in Hell's Kitchen. My name is Steve, and this is my partner, Malcolm. We've lived together for 42 years in San Francisco. I'm Sarah, and this is Sue. Uh, we live in Franklin Park, New Jersey, and we've been together for 12 years. This is John and Ernie. We've been together 25 years, lived in Kentwood, Michigan. I'm Wolf, and this is Roberto, my partner. We've been together for 12 years, and we live in the Bay Area. Originally, I come from Germany. I'm Bill, and this is Dick and we've been together for almost 40 years. I'm Karen and this is Francine. We've been together almost 10 years and we live in New York City. Michael and Scott, uh, we live in San Francisco and we've been together for 23 years. I'm Casey, this is Stacy. We've been together 11 years. Are people born gay or is it a choice? I can't help but wonder who would deliberately choose such a difficult life? Bigotry and the threat of physical violence are an everyday part of life for many gay people. By allowing gay people to marry, Americans can help make the lives of gays and lesbians significantly easier by giving them an acceptable social status, entitling them to the legal benefits that most Americans enjoy and allowing their love to be officially recognized. Back to our couples. Let's look at their various upbringings and hear their coming out stories. It's a continual process of saying, this is what it is for me to be gay, and this is what it looks like, and I know these words are difficult for you, but these are the words to use. We tried 
just last summer to get my mom to stop using the word roommate. Then she moved to friend. Then to actually say partner, she couldn't really say it to somebody else, so we had her practice saying it to a plant. <laughs> and she did, and then she laughed. <laughs> but then she was worried because all the plants knew after that. So. <laughs> the whole yard. <laughs> the whole yard. I'm still talking about it. Well, I kept this private journal about all my innermost thoughts. And um, I came home one night. My mother said, come downstairs. I need to talk with you. She opened up a can of Rheingold beer. So I knew it was serious, because Rheingold beer was for the serious talks. And uh, we sat down at the kitchen table. And my mother said, I read your journal, and I want to know what this means. And I said, you want to know what what means? And she said, I want to know what this means. What, what do you mean you're gay? And I said, well, first of all, you had no business reading my journal. But second of all, yes, mom, I'm gay. And she said, what do you mean you're gay? And I said, well, mom, I slept with men, and I really liked it. And I've slept with women, and I didn't really like it. And my mother replied, I slept with your father for 30 years, and I never once enjoyed it. So I said, well, that's your problem and not mine. Uh, the next day, they changed the locks on the door, and uh, I didn't speak with my family for seven years. And as time went by, um, my mother grew as an individual. She learned about my life and about my lifestyle. Uh, I'm proud to say in my mother's last year, up until about a month before my mother passed, she was doing work collecting toys and clothing for children with AIDS. Uh, she had learned enough at that and had become wise enough to know that it didn't matter. And in her last days, my mother said to me, I'm so happy that you found someone to share your life with. I think it's very rare for parents to be accepting in general. It's not something that you want for your kids. And even being gay, I mean, would I be really happy if my kids were gay? If it gets easier, sure. So, no, my parents weren't happy. And all of a sudden, I said, oh my gosh, I have to call my grandmother, and I have to come out to my grandmother. And I, I got on the phone, and I'm practically in tears at this point. And I said, Nanny, I, I, I have something that I have to tell you, and it's really difficult for me, and, but I just thought you should hear it from me and not from anybody else at the wedding. And my grandmother pipes up and says, Honey, is this about your lifestyle? <laughs> and I said, Yes. She said, I knew. I just didn't want to say anything until you were ready. And this is a woman who's now who's going to be 90. And I think she was the most supportive in my family in general. Uh, my name's Sam Maxwell. I'm 17 years old. I'm the son of Karen and Francine. And uh, this is my friend Matthew Nissenbaum. We've been best friends for about five, six years now. And uh, first time I uh, outed my parents was in an outhouse, a junior house, which is a small little house at the top of a hill up the road. It's all secluded. All secluded. I will remember that. You were really nervous. I was just like, guys, my mom's a lesbian. And they were just like, whoa, really? Yeah. And you know, being the 12 year old kids they are, they're like, cool, mom's a lesbian. After a while, it just became like, you know, second nature. It wasn't a big Absolutely. deal. They're definitely, they're definitely legends in this camp. <laughs> they're such a legend. We, we call them the women. Mine was not accepted very well at all. Um, in fact, it's uh, the way my folks found out was uh, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, there was a, a local uh, issue going on politically that uh, for a human rights ordinance in Saugatuck, and it uh, was got to be a very nasty situation and became headlines throughout the country. And lo and behold, I get a telephone call from my mother one day and I found out it was front page on the Wall Street Journal, which my stepfather, who's a new stepfather, um, subscribes to and gets it daily. So it was quite a shock to them, I'm, I'm sure. And it was a nasty shock to me also. <laughs> I didn't really have any reaction. I think it was all such a surprise in the beginning. And then I just really didn't uh, give it any thought after that because he's my father. And you know, it didn't matter what he did, he was my father. That's how I looked at it. If you had a gay parent, um, whether it's your mother or your dad, you just need to love them. And forever because there's a lot of people who don't and you know, and we see it and um, I see kids that, that like oh I'm so mad at them how could they do this to me how could they make me so embarrassed it's like they're not doing it to you you know they are 
making themselves happy. If they're not happy as a person, how are they going to be a good parent? For me, I, I don't know. I, I think that I first realized that I was gay probably about nine, uh, when I was maybe 17, somewhere around there. And uh, I didn't do much, you know, but uh, then when I went in service, I just slept with everybody I could. <laughs> it was almost that bad, not quite. But it, it seemed like it was, it was uh, that bad. But uh, it, it meant nothing to me, just a, a fling, you know, just something to do until I met Jim. And then it was, that was it. Didn't want anybody else. I realized at a real young age, I can't even remember when, I just always knew that there was this attraction and just comfort with women. Um, and then when I was 15 is when I really realized that that's, you know, what I was, that I was gay. I had a huge crush on one of my sister's friends. I think there are genetics, I know, in our family. It's me and my sister. We have a cousin as well. I would say to anybody who has a gay family member, sibling, mother, child, whatever, to just open their heart and don't let society's um, restrictions restrict your love. Just be open and, and allow them to be themselves. And it's so much more enrich, en enriched. It's just a much better life to be able to just take them in. Yeah, I think, uh, I think all siblings for each other and parents, mothers, all families need to realize that it's, I, I feel it's the health and the happiness that is number one. I really um, wouldn't accept it. And eventually, I saw that this, this is really who she is and that I have a choice in life. If I don't accept it, I push my child away from me and I'm out of her life. And this was crazy. So therefore, I said, no, she, I know she has no choice in who she is. She is who she is. She's my daughter. I love her. And um, I got over it. I came out when I was pretty much 23. So when I was in Chicago, I knew nothing about gay life. Or I had a girlfriend, I was engaged. You know, that whole, you know, lie, 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 pretend, pretend, pretend. Um, but I took my father to Big Daddy's, and um, <laughs> over a Johnny Walker, I pretty much told him what was going on, as if he didn't know. And he sort of started crying, and he's like, it, it doesn't matter, you're my son, I, I love you. and and. Oddly enough, I didn't see him for the next 10 years. It was a very painful process, but um, I'm happy to say that uh, we have a much better relationship now than we've ever had. Um, and he's more accepting. He will never fully accept it, but he can live with it. And he knows that if he wants me in his life, he's going to be the one that's going to have to be more accepting because I cannot possibly change my life to accommodate somebody else's. Um, if I'm not content with who I am, I mean, life is not worth living. And in those days, there were, there were no role models. There was nothing in the movies or in books that are in our community that would help me to understand that I wasn't alone. But then one day, somebody mentioned the word homosexual to me, and I looked it up in the dictionary, and this gave me hope. If there's a word, there must be others. My father was very understanding, although his idea of how I should handle it was uh, not very realistic. He thought I should just, uh, actually he sent me to a psychiatrist who, very brave for those days, said that it was not an illness and was not an abnormality. It was a uh, life pattern that I couldn't avoid. Mac and Steve, I think, are the best role models in the world as far as what a couple should be and how a couple should be. For Mark and I, we hope, have always hoped and still hope and look at their relationship every day in our minds at least, say that's what we need to do. We need to remember the things that they've taught us. Um, they have more love than anybody I've known. After a while, I just realized I had to do something because I wasn't happy the way it was and I met John and that's the way it is now. Well, as a, your wife says, you had a nervous breakdown or two too. Oh. She didn't know why and you told me later that it was probably because you were gay and there was just, you felt no outlet about it. Mm -hmm. So, I think his wife knows the whole thing. She's 
she spends a lot of time with me, more than him. <laughs> I first came to have strong enough feelings, have my feelings for women be strong enough that I couldn't ignore them anymore at around 30. When I went back at one point and looked at journals that I had kept in my younger years and, and realized that the, my feelings for women had always been there and I had just done every, pulled every trick under the sun to, to try to ignore it. When I fell in love with Kate, it was different because it was real. You know? And I was so proud. That is probably when I really finally came out. Well, I have not come out to my family. I figure my parents live in the Deep South and they, Mike and I have been together for 23 years and it's, you know, I just feel if they want to know, they will ask and they haven't. So I haven't told them. Everybody knows everybody and everybody's business. So I'm sure this could be big talk back there. About fifth grade to eighth grade, uh, on every desk in my school was written TBIG. Tony Brown is gay. Everybody knew. I guess, but me. Maybe they saw me staring at my teacher's forearm. But, <laughs> but uh, it was a it was an all boys school, so I literally had no friends. And those boys who would be my friend in a private situation, whenever anyone else would come around, they would immediately start the taunts and stab me in the back. So I was very, very emotionally unstable. I went into my studies. I skipped my freshman year of high school just so I could leave that school and, uh, and, and go to some place that was, you know, more accepting and more, well, more real, because it was truly hellish. Looking for somebody like you. Whoa. We had the opportunity to speak with my friend Evan Wolfson, who is recognized by the National Law Journal as one of the top 100 civil rights attorneys in America. Well, sitting here in 2002, it's actually amazing to remember that just 10 years ago, most people in this country didn't put the words gay and marriage into the same sentence at all. People just weren't thinking about it or talking about it, even though couples, lesbian and gay couples, for decades have been challenging their exclusion from this important institution. But this all changed in 1993 when the Hawaii Supreme Court ruled that the denial of marriage licenses to same-sex couples is unconstitutional. All across the country we're seeing gains and movement in the right direction, but still in all 50 states, gay people are not able to marry. The most exciting change to me in the last 10 years has been that Whereas before, nobody talked about it. Now, according to the NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, more than two-thirds of all Americans believe that gay people will win the freedom to marry. A history-making event happened on June 19, 2002. President George W. Bush signed the Michael Judge Act. This bill was named in honor of the gay New York firefighter chaplain who died in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. It gives a $250,000 federal benefit to the domestic partners of police officers and firefighters who die in the line of duty. Previously, only legal spouses, children, and parents were eligible for this benefit. Lambda Legal is representing two men in two separate cases uh, that are really historic. They're the first cases that we're aware of, at least, um, where uh, a surviving gay partner is seeking the spousal benefit under a workers' compensation law. This is in New York State under the workers' compensation law. We're seeking the spousal benefit for, for one man, Larry Courtney, who lost his life partner, uh, Eugene Clark, in the September 11th attacks on the World Trade Center. At the moment, uh, the only thing that I have been able to collect uh, is from the New York State, um, not, I think it's called the New York State 9-11 Fund. Um, Governor Pataki signed a special executive order that domestic partners would be included in that. Uh, 
I have not been able to collect Eugene's Social Security. Um, the federal funds uh, are really murky at this point. September 11th has made many people who never really understood the issue of uh, discrimination against lesbian and gay people get it for the first time. And one result of that is the New York State Legislature just recently passed uh, a law that extends the workers' compensation spousal benefit to people who lost their domestic partners on September 11th. But that's all. They only extend the benefit to people who lost their domestic partners on September 11th. These couples are seeking civil marriage rights because their partnership is no different than any other marriage. The traditional marriage vows are for better or worse. Here's an intimate moment on that subject that our couple shared with us. I think you're going to enjoy this. What I like about Wolf the most, uh, his sensitivity, his um, sociability, his warmth of character, his um, ability to disarm. I think Stacy has a really good heart and her generosity and the way she treats people and and she's sexy. Larry's a kind, sincere person, very honest, um, affectionate. It's just a very, very nice person. She's deadly honest. She's a beautiful parent, the most uh, earnest lover I can imagine. The thing I like most about Doug is his positive energy. Doug is almost always up and looks at the bright side and sees the good in people. First thing I noticed about him was his eyes and then his gorgeous smile. He was so funny. Um, I think his, his joy of life, he just, everybody who met him knew how much he loved life and how much he enjoyed everything in life. You know, he enjoyed theater, he enjoyed football, he enjoyed, and when he, when he did it, he did it all the way, you know. He was, he was quite a, a, a remarkable person. There was something about her touch that, you know, I mean, she also she's a doctor and she's very smart and I love that and she's real cute and that was it, and I wanted it all my life. And I have it. <laughs> I have it. I have it. What I like about Brian is he is the most well-meaning and sincere person I've ever met in my entire life. I like Lisa's uh, sensitivity. I like um, how much she cares about things. There's the be careful what you ask for, you just might get it kind of quality. I think um, for me there are ways in which I don't understand why she has to care so much about something. Well, Carol can be very stubborn. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably, um, well, stubbornness comes into play, but also uh, possibility of uh, not nagging, but just, you know, aren't you going to do this? Do this. Aren't you going to do this? <laughs> I'm a perfectionist, so I'm probably that good comes into play that a perfectionist always wants things done the right way at the right time. And Carl maybe may be a little bit of a procrastinator. It can be done tomorrow. I think in some ways it's sort of cultural, and it's sort of a good and a bad thing, but, you know, I grew up in a very middle-class American family, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, under the surface and, you know, very calm and smooth. And Fernando is like a hot-blooded Latin Cuban. And so he's very, you know, expressive. And 
you know, in any given day, we could have five outbursts at each other, you know, so it's just this, you know, up and down, up and down, no, everything's fine, ah, you know, yell and scream, but then what's good about it is it gets it out in the open, so nothing's left to linger and, and hang on. And I guess the thing I like least is her tendency to be a little bit too bossy, but on the <laughs> other hand, if I didn't have my boss, I probably wouldn't know what to do with myself. So I think it, it works out pretty well. I think that our faults kind of complement each other. I'm too bossy. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I never told you that. <laughs> Other professions still do not allow domestic partners to receive pension benefits. Married couples receive these benefits automatically. Also, gay and lesbian couples must prepare and file costly legal documents and still cannot change inheritance tax, pension, and social security benefit situations. We have joint accounts and we have all the legal documentation that we can have. It has cost us several thousands of dollars to do that. In fact, when we first had our son and I was seeking second parent adoption, and we looked into the price of it in New York City, it cost about $5,000, which was quite a bit of money. And because of the cost and because of how cumbersome the process was there, we decided to hold off for a little bit because we were expecting to move shortly to a place where it would cost us about $1,500. Um, but it, that was just for the the, the second parent adoption alone, and then, of course, we had to pay will for the wills and the powers of attorney and the hospital visitation forms, and we have everything that we can have uh, except, except for estate planning because we have no money. <laughs> because we can't marry, you know, it, it's a burden, and uh, we've done everything we can in terms of reciprocal wills and um, joint checking account, living wills and power of attorney surrogates and all that stuff. We own some land in North Carolina that we own jointly and you know so for the time being for now it hasn't affected us but you know it really stinks that you know when one of us dies no matter how hard you try to plan your estate you're gonna get shafted a little bit because you don't have the reciprocal inheritance that's automatic without it going through the estate and taxation. and. Um, you know, we're not real big on, oh, we want to be married with a certificate because we're married in our hearts. That's what matters. But I do think that that's the one thing that in our society that really is just atrocious, that, you know, you can have a long-term loving relationship and, you know, social security benefits. You know, when I die, if Fernando's still around, he's not going to get to claim as my widow or widower. You know, why shouldn't he? That's just awful. We were fortunate to interview a former Jesuit priest by the name of John J. McNeil. My book, The Church and the Homosexual, uh, was written because I discovered, both as theologian and as psychotherapist, that practically all the grounds for condemning homosexuality were wrong. Uh, they were based on false understandings, both of scripture, of psychology, and of human sexual nature. Prior to 1300, for centuries, there were forms of gay marriage in the Christian church. In fact, the most famous form was the marriage of uh, Bacchus and Serge, two Roman soldiers who converted to Christianity. Now this is in the Acts of the Martyrs, an official church document. It's third century uh, Acts of the Martyrs, and it makes the statement that gay love will exist not only in this life, but for all eternity. One of the most beautiful statements in scripture reads, if anyone loves, they know God, because God is love. And this is equally true of gay or lesbian people. If they have a deep, genuine love for their partner, they will experience the presence of God in that love. If same-sex marriage became a reality here, uh, I think you would see different people taking advantage of that. And not only would we have same-sex marriage, but we would have fathers saying they want to marry their, their daughters, their stepdaughters, brothers and sisters marrying, people marrying their dogs. I mean, whatever. There'll be no rule here. There would be lawlessness. 
right now there is a movement on that we're involved with for a federal marriage amendment because we recognize that there are only 37 states that have a Defense of Marriage Act. New York is not one of them. And in New York State, I'm concerned about the direction we're going in this issue. But if uh, New York does come out and, and declare same-sex marriage like we, declare, we anticipate Massachusetts might soon, uh, we will do everything possible to, uh, to reverse that decision and hopefully we'll mobilize the Christian community who has been very complacent. I believe that the Christian community is a very honest, wonderful community that feels that they're right, but it is time that they accept the fact that we are born the way that we are born, that I probably would not have chosen any more than Carl would have chosen this lifestyle. We would have gone on to be regular um, married people with children, but we are born who we are and we're happy to who we are, but we had no choice in the matter. And the Christian right needs to realize, like the Europeans have and so many other countries, that um, this is something that is not going away, that we're going to be here forever because we're born this way, and uh, just to encompass us and accept us and get over this anger that they have towards us and put their positiveness into helping other starving children in the world instead of spending so much time fighting this one cause. We asked Sarah and Sue what they're doing to advocate marriage equality. They're one of seven couples suing New Jersey for the right to receive a marriage license. Then we'll hear from Adam Aronson, their attorney. Um, yeah, we're really happy to be plaintiffs because I think the biggest obstacle that Sarah and I face in life is that we're not married and we don't have the benefits other married couples do, but we're doing everything we can to raise our child responsibly, and it's really difficult to do when we can't, you know, financially guarantee and secure her future in ways that we could if we were legally married. One other very important uh, litigation that Lambda recently started is in New Jersey representing seven lesbian and gay couples who want to marry. We're basing this litigation completely on New Jersey law and the New Jersey Constitution. Uh, the New Jersey Equal Protection Law as well as the, uh, the right to privacy under New Jersey's Constitution. Let's start with privacy first. Making a decision about who you want to spend the rest of your life with, who you want to commit the rest of your life with, who you're in love with, it's one of the most personal, private, and important decisions that any person makes in their entire life. For the government to interfere with that decision and to deny you the right to make that commitment to somebody just because of the sex of that person is an interference with your right to privacy. That's the first part of the case. The second part is denial of equal protection. Denying lesbian and gay couples marriage licenses when you're giving those marriage licenses and those marriage certificates to heterosexual couples is a basic denial of equality. It's a basic denial of civil rights. One day our daughter came home from preschool and she was upset because someone had told her that we couldn't get married and she thought we were married. And she said, well, I thought you were married and you know, somebody, you know, she mentioned the child's name, told me you can't get married. And then, you know, Sarah said to her, well, we're married in our hearts, but we're not <laughs> married as far as the law is concerned. And I want her growing up you know, I want her to grow up and to be able to look at us and know we did everything within our means, everything possible to make us a legal family. You know, we don't want her to think her family is anything less than any other family, and we want her to think that we're willing, you know, we want her to know that we're willing to fight for what we believe in. And if it takes, like, you know, fighting the state of New Jersey or saying we'll be a plaintiff couple and, you know, we'll expose ourselves, we'll do that because it's important for us and it's important for her. Married people really take for granted the, the protections uh, and benefits that go with marriage, but the, the seven plaintiff couples that we have in our New Jersey case really help illustrate um, how important those benefits and protections are. Five of, of our couples have children. Um, marriage provides protections 
for those children. And we could have had a commitment ceremony, and we could have had all our friends come, and we could have had a big reception. It would have felt kind of empty. It would have been as if we were putting on an act, because when it comes down to it, it's not recognized, and we wouldn't have been legally married. And I think what we want is to be married. We, want, we don't want to pretend we're married or to play house. We just want to be married. As you know, all our couples have been together at least 10 years. So we asked them, what's kept them together all this time? And if they ever had any type of commitment ceremony? I think it's because we talk about everything. We don't have secrets. We don't lie to each other. We know what we're doing. Um, and I think a lot of couples try to keep secrets from each other, and that's just not smart. I think friendship, that we really like each other. Yeah. I think in many ways we also come from the same mold. We have pretty, really solid backgrounds, great families, and, you know, we have a very balanced life. We have made a rule when we first met that we never go to bed at night mad at each other. It constantly feels like I'm meeting Maria for the first time. I, that sounds corny or weird or something, but it's actually true. It's, it's a strange thing that happens for me that I'm constantly rediscovering her. Oh, I think it's because we have so much in common. I mean, yes. we have so much in common. I mean, politically, emotionally, our feelings about family, our feelings about what's important in life. I mean, we have so much in common. A lot of give and take. And of course, love is, I think, number one when you find somebody you really care for. And as the years went along, we had a lot invested in our lives together. And um, Carl had been married and had three children, and it was always something in the back of my mind that um, he left his family for me, which kind of was a very important thing for me to always remember that somebody cared that much for me. So when things got a little bit tough or you had arguments or stuff like that, you had to always remember that tomorrow's going to be a better day. We had a, a Jewish wedding because my, fa my side of the family is Jewish and uh, back when Reformed Judaism kind of accepted same-sex marriages, we got my parents' blessing to go ahead and have a wedding as well. And so we did that. And it was just, it was wonderful. We had a rabbi and we have a ketubah. Huge wedding party, huge wedding party. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And in the Jewish religion, a ketubah is basically um, like a contract between the couple, you know, in regards to commitment and spending your life together. And we had that, and Ryan was the ring bearer. We had a little ceremony before with the two of us and Ryan and the rabbi. Well, and we exchanged rings. We all exchanged rings. And, um, and then when we went great. to break the glass, and he <laughs> broke the glass at the end, it, neither one of them broke. <laughs> so we were like pounding. We things. were af afraid our marriage was jinxed, but you know, 11 years later, we're still here, and uh, I don't think. We, still we, we broke it the second time around. <laughs> so. Their wedding was, I mean, I married off an old, a younger son, and I've gone to a million weddings. Their wedding was the most fabulous wedding I have gone to. The love in that room, it just, it was beautiful. It was so beautiful. We found a Methodist minister who had... Berkeley's hippest minister. That was his claim to fame, who had actually had a number of gay couples in his congregation and had been hoping that somebody would ask him to perform a ceremony and no one had. So he was really happy to do it and did a lovely job presiding. We were living in San Francisco at the time and um, my mom flew in from Florida, and uh, that was a really um, important moment in our relationship. She read something, oh, and everybody was crying. But when she got stood up and started talking, <laughs> it did have an impact on, on, on the crowd. Because it was clear what, how far she had come to be there, not just 3,000 miles, but emotionally to to be there um, giving her blessing at this ceremony that we were creating. And she really did bring herself there. I was thinking about um, when Sam heard uh, on television, heard Renee speaking about the wedding party, and he turned to us and he said, are you guys going to do that? 
And so that was really, that really touched us, that that was important to him. My name is Renee. This is my partner, Gabriella. We've been together for five years. Uh, Gay Pride is actually our anniversary. We're part of the founding member committee for the wedding party. And the wedding party uh, is basically a nonprofit organization that honors and celebrates same-sex commitment and focuses on the need for equal marriage rights. It's a wedding party ceremony. And um, it starts out with incredible speakers from, you know, uh, politicians that support equal marriage rights to Evan Wolfson, but the, the beauty about it is the ceremony. And it's an interfaith ceremony in which couples exchange um, marriage vows, essentially, and though it's not legally binding yet, it's a way in which they, with their friends and family and the community watching, both not stri you know, gay and non-gay, um, it's a way in which they commit themselves to each other and, and, and show, you know, hey, we're a couple just like anybody else and we want to be committed to each other and we want to be accepted out there in society. We did get married in Germany. We had our reception in a restaurant on the banks of the Spree River. There was actually a magistrate, a justice of the peace, if you will, for the gay ceremonies that uh, actually we had to hire a legal interpreter to go over the, all the papers in the morning and then in the afternoon I had to hire another legal interpreter to actually do the ceremony. So it was a by. Uh, cultural bilingual uh, ceremony. It was really great. We, we read a poem to each other. You are a good man, a man who embodies old-fashioned values like character and integrity. And when I see these things in you, I feel proud. You are a loving man, a man who shows his devotion in countless acts of thoughtfulness. And when I'm wrapped in the warmth of your embrace, I feel truly fulfilled. You are my man, a man who is my partner, my lover, and my very best friend. And every time I see you or touch you or hear your name, I feel love. Marriage is the legal gateway to a vast array of protections and responsibilities under law at every level of law. There are over 1,049 federal protections and benefits and responsibilities connected to marriage alone not to mention state law and city law and private jurisdictions and so on. Being married affects your ability to have access to health care, affects your ability to ensure that your partner and your dependents are covered when it comes to health or inheritance or taxation or even the transfer of property without being taxed between yourselves. It enables you legally to pool your resources in times of ordinary life and in terms of kind of times of crisis. It ensures that if somebody's in an accident and you're rushing to that hospital, you can say the magic words, that's my wife, that's my husband, and be whisked right through to be there at the bedside and be, instead of being turned away because no matter how long you've been together, you're no more than roommates under the eyes of the law. Gay couples face many other obstacles because they cannot legally marry, including medical coverage, inheritance benefits, immigration, and adoption rights, just to name a few. This is what we mean by wanting equality in marriage. Our biggest problem is the federal immigration law and the fact that the federal government does not recognize our relationship that has been recognized by the city, has been recognized by the state, but we have no rights regarding his status as an immigrant. There is no status to our relationship as a married couple, although in Germany we have full rights and benefits. If we were legally married, um, I would imagine you would be able to adopt Ryan. I mean, well, right. I'm not sure. I think it's just it's, in some states you can adopt. Like in, I have a friend in Massachusetts who could have adopted her partner's biological children and didn't for whatever reason. But I think it's just the state of Florida that is not allowing me to adopt Ryan. If they had gay parents, they, they'd probably love them just as much as having a mom and dad. But you have two moms, so you'd love them just as much. If you um, apply to adopt a child in the state of Florida, you go down to the you know child department of uh, welfare, and you fill out an application. And question 2G says, are you a homosexual? And then next to that, it is a yes or no question. And next to that, it quotes the Florida statute, which says something to the effect that you know no person otherwise qualified to 
serve as an adoptive parent may adopt in the state of Florida if that person is a homosexual. Obstacles that we've we've run across because we're gay men, um, the, the the adoption is probably the, the, the probably the thing that sticks out the most um, and the most frustrating. You can be able not to knowing that you know you are probably well qualified to be parent and be told that because of your sexual preference you can't be a parent I mean what does parenting have to do with sexuality and I asked that question you know when we went through the process it doesn't in the state of Florida at any given time there are 3,500 kids waiting to be adopted and, it, and their average age is seven years old just put yourself in those shoes and think of the suffering I mean this isn't about this isn't even about gay people this law is an anti-child law the happiest time of my life was one day we were we had just had Josh and I mean he was still kind of staying with us on the weekend or whatever and one day we were at the playground and Josh came up to both of us and uh, he looked at us and he says, you know what, I don't have a daddy. Will you be my daddies? And I said, I would love to be your daddy. And that's how we came to adopt our son. And I think it was the most precious, happy moment of, of my life. When we started to adopt Josh, as Mike said, it was just, I think much more difficult for us. It took two years. And I think a normal adoption would, would have taken about six months. In a case like this? Uh, we had people, I mean, this, we, we, were, we had people sent into our homes probably 10 to 12 times to do home investigations and investigations of me and Mike and us and, you know, other, as, you know, the heterosexual community does not have to go through that. There is the outside, you know, the thing that still is kind of frightening. You know, if you're traveling on vacation together, unless you're bringing your legal documents with you, God forbid something should happen to either one of us, you could easily not allow us access to one another. So, I mean, there's still the frightening. As many things as you try to take care of, there's still that fear. The biggest one is the obstacle we have right now, and that's that with Karen's MS and the stress that she has at work, because of the mental health system closing down in this state. Um, the doctor really wants her not to be working right now and because I can't put her on my health insurance, she can't quit working because she has about like $3,500 worth of medical bill, medicine bills a month. And if we, have, if we were legally married, then she could go on my um, medical insurance. Another groundbreaking event occurred on July 13, 2002. The Ontario Superior Court ruled that banning gay marriage is illegal. This is a major step toward formally recognizing equality in marriage in Canada. Other countries have already expanded marriage equality to non-traditional couples. Did you know that in August 2001, Germany passed a law creating partnerships like marriage for gay people, and in the Netherlands, two people can legally marry, no matter what their gender. The United States is lagging far behind. Canada, the Netherlands, Europe, our other allies in providing protection for gay couples, and until we end this discrimination, the United States will not be in the forefront of civil rights protections for all its citizens. There are so many ways gay and non-gay Americans can help change current laws to give same-sex couples equality in marriage. One of the easiest ways you can help is by voting for progressive politicians who support civil marriage rights and by participating in organizations such as Marriage Equality New York and California and the Human Rights Campaign, to name a few. Finally, we popped the question. If you could get married legally, would you? If we could be legally married, we would create the most joyous celebration, the greatest exhalation of energy and of love. And, and exactly, we would invite everyone, everyone who has ever meant something to us, who we've ever shared anything with. I think I would marry Brian in a heartbeat. 
but I think I am married to Brian. Brian and I are spiritually married. We've been, being married to me means sharing 17 Christmas tree. Being married to me means we have these wonderful dogs. Being married to me means we're gonna have kids. Being married to me means we share so much of a life together. Why I'd wanna be married is so that we could show other people uh, that it's not such a scary thing that two men can have a relationship of significance and that relationship can last forever. That's why I'd wanna be married. We could have a ceremony and we're not even registered as domestic partners. We haven't even done that. So if you ask me if we could get uh, to have a ceremony and a marriage ceremony, and my immediate reaction is yes. Yet we haven't done any of those other things. And I think that's because those other things don't mean anything. They, have, they hold no weight. If, when people tell me I can be legally married and everything that comes along with that, we're going to be first in line. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> She wants to register, and I've never registered. I think it's the experience of walking into a store and going, okay, I just, I want that, and that, and that, and that, and you write it all down, and you just see what you, see what you get. I think that's, that's an amazing concept. If we could be legally married, yes, we would be legally married. Right. There's no, no doubt about it. I think that it's very important for people to have civil rights, um, le legal rights, that uh, put, place them on par with other people that we deserve to have equal recognition from the law. We'll be going to Vegas, baby. <laughs> Drive through. Elvis Chapel, here we come. Yeah, absolutely we would. And I think it's, it's high time that we should be able to. I would go through the process. Um, for one thing, for, for Ryan, um, just because it's the right thing to do. If we could be legally married, we would get married. I oh, mean, yes. yeah, especially as you get older, there's a lot of issues that come up. So if we were married, we'd have rights and we should have those. But as you do start to get older and you realize the benefits that you're not receiving and the fear, like he said, if one of us became sick, would it be possible that the other one could have the right to um, hospitals and that type of say so that you would need in taking care of the other one or would the family come in and um, make choices that would be against your choices. So definitely I think that um, in our situation that we would 100% definitely have a legal marriage. Well I would definitely be legally married, I mean for my son. Uh, you know, as, as much for, for our son as for us. No question about it. And I think that this country would benefit from our being able to travel uh, freely and comfortably, he would be able to work and uh, we'd be able to pay more taxes. Actually, if we were married, perhaps we'd get some tax benefits, <laughs> but we don't have now. But yeah, we own property in Hawaii, but we, and uh, we would like to travel more, but we can't with the current situation. We have to spend the money on his leaving the country rather than staying in the country, and that doesn't make any sense to me. In this so-called defense of marriage law that they pushed through Congress in 1996, it says that even when gay people do win the freedom to marry somewhere, and some state allows couples to take on that commitment, the federal government will discriminate against their marriages. And under this law, we will have two kinds of marriage in America. First-class marriage for, for couples that the government likes, and second-class marriage for gay couples which will receive no protection, no recognition, no support at the federal level, no matter how committed they are, no matter how long they've been together. Congress could overturn the Defense of Marriage Act. Congress could recognize the huge mistake that it made in passing the Defense of Marriage Act and, uh, and strike it down on its own. If Congress does not undo the damage that it did with the Defense of Marriage Act, then it would be up to a federal court at that point to decide whether the Defense of Marriage Act is constitutional. My three wishes would be uh, for acceptance, for everybody just to let me be who I am, let Mike and I and our family be who we are and not judge us. To be able to go anywhere to get on a plane and go anywhere and be treated the same as, as all other married people is, other married families. I guess my third wish would be is, is to be legally married.
to be accepted by our government and our and our country. They, you know, they say we live we live in in the home of freedom, but I just I don't feel that yet. Stand up in the shadow too long Waiting on the sideline too long Oh, I've been watching you now You're gonna watch me too Come